Hello, good morning, welcome. This is the Lambda and Streams Masterclass Part 2. It's a continuation of yesterday's uh, Part 1. Uh, we're going to be covering different material today. Uh, if, you were, if you were here yesterday, uh, thank you for coming back. If you weren't here yesterday, uh, we're going to be covering different material. We may refer to some things that were discussed yesterday, and uh, we'll try to fill in the gaps if there were... Uh, yeah, if, if, in case you weren't here yesterday. Uh, my name is Stuart Marks. This is Jose Pomard. Hello. Um, so uh, these are our Twitter handles here. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. I work at Oracle. I work on the JDK core libraries, including collections, uh, streams, lambdas, uh, and a variety of other things. Um, Jose? Yes, so my name is Jose. Uh, we've been working together on this lab for the past three or four years, something like that. So this is the part two. Uh, I didn't push the slide on the online on my SlideShare account yet. It's going to be done probably by this afternoon. And also all the code that we showed yesterday and that we're going to show today uh, will also be pushed on GitHub on the different repositories that we've created for that. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. We've created a uh, hashtag for this uh, for this presentation, Lambda HOL. A lot of the material is based on a hands-on lab that we've run uh, at several conferences over the past few years. Um, so, um, so we're reusing the hashtag for that. Uh, we will be monitoring this, if possible, during the presentation, but certainly afterwards. If you have questions, follow-up comments, uh, please uh, please don't hesitate to tweet to us on this hashtag, and we'll look forward and try to answer any questions you have. And especially for the people who are following us online, if, you're, if you're, there are any people on YouTube or Periscope watching this presentation who are not in the room, if you use this hashtag, we'll gladly answer your questions that you may have. That's right. Thank you. Okay, so this is, this is today's agenda. Actually, there's one, something before, <laughs> before yeah. this, which is a follow-up question from yesterday that we need yeah. to answer. But um, <clears throat> the focus of yesterday's presentation was on lambdas and functions and combining functions and higher-order functions uh, and partial application. And so today's focus is going to be less about functions and lambdas and more about streams and streams techniques. So um, we're going to have a little bit of setup. Um, we'll post some URLs so you can, you can uh, download some code if you want to follow along on your laptop. Uh, and then we're going to be going through the uh, stream, various streams operations. This is not an introduction to streams. We're going to very quickly mention map, filter, and flat map. Uh, and then we're going to move into reduction and a lot of material on collectors. The collectors end of streams is a very, very rich interface, and so there's lots to be explored there. And then uh, finally, there are some extra techniques at the end we'll, we'll cover, um, having to do with just, just different techniques for using streams uh, that might not occur to you. Um, okay, so comparator stuff? Yeah, we had a question yesterday on comparators. Right about the null's last comparator, was it? So basically, we had this comparator yesterday that we showed yesterday. And uh, the question was, I, I don't know if the, the person who asked the question is still in the room. OK, great. So here's your answer. <laughs> um, so the question is, what if one of the, the um, key extractor um, function that we pass as a parameter to either the comparing or the then comparing method uh, returns a null value? Right, and there is this comparator called comparator dot nulls last or nulls first that takes itself another comparator as a parameter, and that will deal with null value, putting them at the end of the sorting or the sorted array, sorted list, or at the beginning of it. So basically, this comparator, if you want it to uh, handle null values, what you can do is use the version, the overload of this method, which takes itself another comparator as a parameter. You may want to sort your list of people using their last name in the alphabetical order, which is the natural order to sort uh, strings of characters, but you may also as well want to use another uh, comparator. And if your function does not return a comparable object, then you need to provide a comparator for the comparison to, 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 to work, basically. So in fact, comparing person get last name is equivalent to comparing person get last name, same function. And you pass another comparator, well, a comparator as a parameter, that, uh, the second parameter, sorry, that is going to be used to compare the, the last name of the people, which is in this case the natural order comparator that is going to use the fact that strings are comparable. So those two lines of code are equivalent. 
So it means that the, par the comparator passed as a parameter is going to be used to compare the strings. So the trick is, you can pass a compare.nulls last or nulls first comparator as this second comparator in that way, right? Uh, you comparator.nulls last natural order is the comparator that will just compare the strings that are non-null in the classical way and pull and put the null strings at the end of the sorted list, basically. So this pattern will handle the fact that your person dot the colon colon get last name may return null values and will prevent any null pointer exception to be thrown, which is nice because nobody likes null pointer exceptions. And if you want to deal with null values in your people list or people array, then you need to wrap this comparator in a null's last comparator also. So you have this kind of double wrapping. Comparator.nulls last will deal with instances of person that may be null in the, the array of person that you need to sort. And the nested comparator dot nulls last that takes the comparator natural order as a parameter will deal with null value returned by the key extractor function. Right. So this is the the right pattern to do it. Mm -hmm. It may look a little complex, but I think it's much less complex than having to write all this by hand. Yeah, one, one thing I've, uh, <laughs> I was thinking, I, I forgot to do it, but uh, if you write out the code, the, in, instead of using the comparator interface and the utility methods on it, if you actually write out the code that has the logic that says, oh, if it's null, okay, if both of these are not null, then compare them otherwise, it, uh, it gets very complicated very fast, and um, it's much easier to use the comparator utility methods to construct a comparator that has the right properties that you want. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Maybe we should quickly go through the yeah. setup of the lab? Right. All right. So just as, last, uh, just as uh, the last session yesterday morning, there is a GitHub repo with everything almost ready, with failing tests that we're going to make pass, hopefully, without using the at ignore. Uh, tag because that would be cheating. Um, so the, 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 the link is basically the same as the one we p uh, published yesterday. There's just a two to replace the one because it's part two instead of part one. Right. Fair enough. So, yeah. so before you advance here, so, so the, the first URL on here is the hands-on yeah. lab that we have running, we've been running for the past few years. So that's useful for reference. I encourage you to go look at that. Um, there's, there's a lot of exercises there, uh, but that's not exactly what we're going to be covering today. I mean, the what we're doing, what we're covering today, is certainly the materials derivative from that, um, but that's useful for reference stuff. The bottom two URLs are the materials for yesterday's and today's presentations. So if you want to follow what we're what we'll be doing today, of course, is mm. Lambda Masterclass Part Two. Yeah. So if you want to get started on that, please uh, clone this uh, GitHub repo and pull that into an IDE yeah. if you're following on along on a laptop. And so what we'll do in the middle is we'll take occasional breaks for if you're, if you're working on a laptop, then you can try to do the exercises using this project. Um, if you're not on a laptop, then I think you could sit quietly and think <laughs> about how you might solve the problem if you had a, if you had a laptop. Um, but also we'll try to fill in some details in the slides so that if you don't have a laptop and you're not looking directly at the code, you'll still be able to follow what's going on. Okay. Okay. Two more things about the setup. We are going to use, we're just presenting that because we are not going to, to show it anymore in the presentation, but this is the alphabet list that we are going to use all through the examples of this presentation. So until the very end, it's the basic uh, it, it's uh, the, airplane the, Yeah, used. radio, radio yeah, code. Absolutely, alphabet that you may uh, already know. And this is, okay, you're going to talk about uh, this. Well, yes, this is... Uh, this you're the expert in this matter. <laughs> Hardly. So this is, this is the text of uh, Shakespeare's first sonnet. Um, it's just, just some random text organized into lines. Uh, and so again, it's used for the examples. Some of the examples we'll be showing yeah. later on in the presentation. Okay. And we are going also to use a, a method that basically uh, expand the string of characters into an array of strings. Right. Right. Yeah. So this is this is this is something that we'll use. Um, it's kind of an interesting technique, uh, but uh, there's something we use in the examples where we take t a string and split it up into single character strings. Well, actually, not single characters, single code point strings. And so, if you this is something that tripped up Jose, I have to say. <laughs> um, 
this code actually only runs on JDK 11, because if you get the code points of a string, you get a stream of int values. And so there's a bunch of Unicode stuff here, but not all uni the point is Unicode characters are not all representable in a single Java char. And so some Unicode characters, particularly emoji, will take two char values. And what, code, what the code points method will do is give you a stream of int values that combines those properly. And then what's new is that you can take an int value and construct a single code point string out of it. That's that, that API was added in JDK 11. Um, so previously to that, the only way to construct a string was from a char or from an array of two chars, which was quite inconvenient for this. So if you, if you try to type this in and your, your system is not configured for JDK 11, you will actually have a problem with this code. Yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's probably too much about Unicode. Uh, that's not the main point of this yeah, talk, but, but that's, we'll be using this in some of the later examples just so you know what's going on. Okay. All right, shall I take this? Okay, so first, a uh, quick... Quick background on some simple uh, streams operations. Um, so let's take the, the list of alphabet words and just do a couple simple tasks on them. Uh, first, take each word and transform it or map it into all uppercase, and then keep only the words that have six letters. So we'll use the map and filter operations to do that. So we take the alphabet list, stream it, map it to string colon colon to uppercase, filter, and filter keeps the elements that match this predicate. And so if the word's length is six, then those are kept, and then we just print it out here. And so that's the result of this, which is the uppercase words, and they all have six letters. So that's pretty simple, just, to, just as a little warm-up example. And so that's basically it on map and filter. I, I, I hope that everybody is familiar with map and filter already. I think those are pretty, uh, pretty simple stream operations. All right, now let's move right into flat map. Uh, so flat map is something, um, it's, it's a little interesting phenomenon. Uh, I, I've gotten, I, when I saw flat map, I said, oh, I, I, I know immediately what that is. And I know a bunch of people who are that way, but it's okay if you don't get it. There are a lot of people I've gotten feedback from. It's like, wow, I just don't get flat map. So we're gonna be spending some time on flat map here. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit subtle, so uh, I think it's worth spending some time on. So flat map is an intermediate stream option, operation, just like, uh, just like map and filter. And so map uh, consumes one element from a stream and produces one element from a stream. So if you have a certain number of elements in the stream and you run it through a map operation, you always have exactly that same number of elements in the stream. Flat map is different. It consumes an element, but it can produce zero or more elements. So the, the number of elements it can produce is variable depending on whatever it's, whatever it's doing. And so, so map, takes an element and returns an element, flat map takes an element and returns an arbitrary number of elements. So how do, we, uh, how do we represent an arbitrary number of elements in Java? Well, we could use an array, or we could use a collection, but since this, is, since this is the streams API, we actually use a stream. So what flat map does is it takes a function that consumes one element and returns a stream of results. Now, what's nice is that the stream can be empty, or it can have one element, or it can have any number of elements. So let's run an example through this here. Okay, so again, we'll start off with this alphabet string, alpha, bravo, charlie. And then, using that expand function that we talked about a bit earlier, let's expand each word into single letter strings. And so, if we turn a word into a stream of strings, then we get what's in the second result here, which is a list of lists. And so there's this nesting structure that's, that's going on here. And sometimes we don't want to do that. And so instead of having a two-level structure where you have the outer list and an inner list containing the characters of each word, we want to flatten that structure. And so that's where flat map comes from. So it does a mapping operation, so it, takes each, um, so it takes each input element and produces multiple output elements, but then it 
doesn't preserve the, 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 the structure of, of, of the output elements there. And so the result will be something like on the bottom where we have a flattened structure consisting of all the letters. And, and what's, what's notable about this is looking at the bottom result, we can't tell where the original letters came from. So in the top, sorry, in the middle result, one word was emitted and that resulted in one list in the output stream. Um, but since it's been flattened, we just have a flat structure of individual letters and we can't tell where each individual letter came from anymore. And sometimes you want that. You want to flatten out. If, you, if the structure is no longer important, then you want to use flat map. So let me show the code that does that. Well, actually, this isn't the code yet. So this is, uh, this is not using flat map. This is what happens if you use the map operation to take one word and expand it into a, uh, a list of letters. And so that's where we get this nesting structure. So map returns a list and then we collect, we collect those lists into an outer list. And so we get that, that, uh, the list of list kind of structure there shown at the bottom. Now, if we change this to use flat map instead, a couple things here. One is we call this expand method again, and that returns us a list. But the function we pass to flat map needs to have a stream. And so how do we get a stream from a list? Well, we just call the stream method on it. So flat map takes the word, converts it to a list of letters, and then gets a stream out of that. And then the contents of that stream are inserted into the outer stream, and all of those results are collected into a single level list. So now we have, we have a, a flattened structure of the individual letters. Yeah. All right. There's, a, there's a typo on the slide here, I think. Uh, is there? Anyway, yeah. It's not a list of lists, it's just a list. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, this should be a list of string, not a list of list of string. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Well, it always happens. <laughs> OK, so now here's, uh, here's our first exercise. OK, so we'll take, the, uh, we'll take uh, Shakespeare's sonnet which is uh, just a list of strings, and split each line into words. And so there's, we'll just use a simple, uh, simple split method with this uh, regular expression to do that. Um, and one of the things about line.split is that it returns an array, not a stream. So we'll have to deal with that. So anyway, so take each line of the sonnet, split it into words, and then collect all of those words into a single flattened list. So did, did you want to do the, the code for that? Or should we, yeah. uh, how did you want to, how, you um, want to proceed how many that? people do have a laptop ah, with yes, them good question. for this exercise? Oh, okay. we've got oh, a fair, fair number of people. people. Okay. All right, so so um, maybe, maybe we should let, give you some time to do it. What about singing a little song or telling <laughs> jokes to the audience? <laughs> Among the others, who like regular expressions? Ah, yes. There's still a fair amount of people that yeah. do that. I'm always amazed that, to see that such a cryptic way yeah. of expressing simple things <laughs> <laughs> may be so popular. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much power there is in regular expressions. Oh, yes, indeed. All right, so it... it, it it should be fairly obvious that we want to use flat map here, since this yeah. segment is about flat map. Um, the, uh, there's an API to turn an array into a stream. Um, actually, there are a couple. You can say stream.of and pass it an array. Um, but I prefer arrays.stream. Is there a difference um, between both? Yeah, it's subtle. I think if you, if you pass something to arrays.stream, sorry, if you pass something to stream.of and it's not an array, you get a stream consisting of only that element. And that's okay. because stream.of is var args. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful with var args sometimes. If you, have, if you pass it a single argument, then there's an ambiguity when calling var args in Java. <clears throat> if you pass it a single element that's not an array, then that's one element. But if you pass it a single element that is an array, then you get the elements of that array. So if you're not careful, you can get the wrong thing. And it should have several arrays. That's true. <laughs> Possible. All right, why don't we, uh, why yeah, don't we okay. move on here? 
Okay, so this is, this is our solution to it. Uh, split the sonnets into words and collect all the words into a single list. Okay, so we take the, the sonnet, it's a list of lines, and we stream it, flat map that into, we take each line, and then I'm gonna read this from the inside out. We split it into words using that split expression, and then that gives us an array of words, and then we wrap that in arrays.stream, and that gives us a stream of words. And then that in turn goes into the flat map operation, so that extracts each individual word from, from, this, from the stream that was returned and inserts those words into the outer stream. And then we collect them into a destination list. And so then we get a, I'm not gonna, I don't have the whole, uh, uh, the whole sonnet here, but we get a flattened list of, of the words from Shakespeare's sonnet in order. All right, yeah. anything? Fine. Any, any questions about flat map before we move on? Um, if there are, if there are any questions, we'll, uh, if, you can just, if you have a quick question, raise your hand and yell it out. We'll repeat it for the recording. Um, and actually, can you check yep, Twitter so there? Is there? I went. Going on there. Character.toString. Yes, is this, okay. Yeah, so there's a question about uh, code point. There's a new overload in JDK 11 that takes, uh, for character.toString, takes a, an int code point. And that was introduced in JDK 11, uh, which was missing from previous JDK versions. So. Okay. Did you choose the music? No. No, I didn't. We didn't. Choose we, didn't we didn't choose the music. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's move on. So the next topic is reduction. Ah, reduction. Okay. You wanna you wanna do that or should no, I? Or? Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the the general principle of reduction is. Oh, is there is there a question there? Yeah. Okay, all right, so this, uh, actually we should talk about this often. The question was about lazy evaluation versus flat map, and this is actually a, a bit of a contentious issue. Um, there is currently a, a characteristic of the implementation where it, the flat map stream is actually evaluated eagerly, and various people have complained about that, and I think that's, uh, that is an issue, uh, but there are a variety of reasons where it's very difficult to fix that. Uh, so if you, want, if you want to hear more about this, maybe we can talk about that offline. Okay, so reduction. So most of the streams that we've shown so far will take every element from a stream and do something with that individual element. And so for instance, at the beginning we had a for each with system out print line, and that would take each element of the stream and print it out, right? Or uh, there's a common thing that you've seen a lot in some of these examples is collecting to a list. So it takes each element of the stream and puts the elements into a list and returns the list. Uh, and so reduction is a different concept here. And the idea is that we take every element of the stream and combine them somehow and produce a single result value. And so the example that we're using here is a, uh, is a mathematical one because it's very easy to combine um, it's very, very easy to combine numbers in a way that's pretty obvious. So for instance, suppose that we want to compute a, uh, a factorial function and here we're deliberately choosing a fairly large number that can't be computed using, uh, using primitive arithmetics. Uh, so we're going to be using big integer instead. So what we want to do, I guess I'll just show the code here, what we want to do is create a range of of numbers from, okay, so we want 21 factorial, so we wanna create a, a range of numbers from one to 21, and then we create big integers out of each of them. And so that's what map to obj converts a primitive into an object using big integer dot value of. So we take the long value and turn it into a big integer with the equivalent value. So now we have a stream of one to 21 big integer values. And what's funny was in the initial version of this, we started at zero and, and this don't, didn't work. Don't do that. No. <laughs> well, it does, in fact, it yeah. makes the computation much easier. To yeah, do. that's true. <laughs> that's pretty funny. We're always so used to starting at zero. We started from zero on this and it's like, oh, wait a minute. 
<laughs> How come this isn't working? Okay, now there's a little bit of uh, little little bit of interesting things here. What we want to do is we want to take this whole range from one to twenty one, and we want to multiply them all together. So how do you do that? Well, so the the e maybe the easiest way to think about reduction is if you have a if you have a long stream or list or collection of values, reduction says take this operation and put it between each pair of values. So we have one times two times three times four da -da -da -da, times 21. And so that's exactly what factorial is. And so that's what this reduce operation does at the, um, um, at the, on the last line of the sample code. Uh, because we are reducing the stream of big integers over the operation big integer multiply. So we're multiplying all the big integers together. Now there's this other thing there, this, this first argument, which is big integer dot one. So why is that there? So it's there for two reasons. Because actually the way it works is the, we don't just take the, the stream of numbers, we start off with a number and then, or we start off with a value and then use that as the base with which to start the reduction. And so the idea is that that must be the, the value you must provide there must be the identity value for the function you are providing. So the identity value for a function is if you use this value and apply it to this function, then the result is the same as the input. So what do you do? What's the, what's the identity value for multiply? It's one, of course. You take any number, multiply it by one, you get the same number back. So that's why we have big integer dot one there. And so the reason we start off with a seed value is there's this question of what happens if the stream, if the input stream is empty? Well, the result of the reduction is that initial value. So if you, uh, and I think mathematically this works out. If you have, I think if you define zero factorial, that means you're multiplying no numbers together and that result is defined to be one because yeah. it, it makes sense. So anyway, so that's how that's a simple, uh, simple use of reduction there. Uh, anyway, so if you print that out, then you get this very large number. What is that? Fifty-one quadrillion or something like that? Quintillion. Fifty-one um, billions of billions. Yeah. Uh, so that is. Uh, but again, the idea is you take uh, a series of values and you combine them all together using a single operation. And so that's what reduction is in its simplest form. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing with functions, which is a bit of a curveball. All right, so now let's, let's talk about, uh, like imagine you're programming a shopping website. And so if you're, if, you're, if you're at a company and you have a lot of products available online, you, in order to provide a decent shopping experience for your customers, you might want to allow them to uh, filter the set of products that are shown. So you might write some code like this. You might have something that says, you know, I want to determine what products should be shown to the user. And this function takes a predicate that says, what's the filter that I'm going to apply to, to cut down the number of products uh, that's visible to the customer. So if, you, if, you, if the customer goes to the website, it shows him 10,000 products. The customer says, okay, I, you know, I'm not going to page through 10,000 products. I want to look at, uh, I want to look at the particular ones. So the customer can apply some filters to cut down that number to, to better find what they're looking for. So you might do it something like this. So this show method takes a predicate. And so we have some method somewhere that returns a stream or a list of all products or something like that. We stream it and then filter it through this predicate, collect those results into a list and return it. So we've, we've taken the input set of products and cut them down according to the user's criteria. Um, well, being able to apply one predicate is really not all that useful, right? So if you have 10,000 products, the customer might wanna say, well, I wanna look at this kind of widget but not that kind of widget. Or the customer might want to say, I want to look at products that are only less than 100 euros in price. Or you, know, you can imagine a, a wide variety of different filters that the customer might want to apply. So here, let's, let's, uh, we're showing a, a slightly nicer example where the customer can apply two filters. So we have two predicates, and we have the same stream, stream pipeline here, except that to the filter method, we're combining those two predicates into a single one using the and method. So we take two predicates, 
called P1 and P2, and then produce a single predicate called P1 dot and P2, and then use that to filter the stream. An alternative is to actually have two filter steps in your stream. And so this is, and then we collect the results into a list and return that. And so this is nice, but if you have a lot of products, the customer might want to apply three filters. And so why stop at three? Are you going to are you going to say p1 dot and p2 dot and p3, or have three filters in your stream? Um, oh, okay. So so let's focus on the and method here. So if we have, uh, we did cover some of this yesterday. So uh, those of you who are here yesterday might remember some some work in this area. If we have two predicates. We can create a combined predicate out of them by using the AND method. And that's a single predicate that can be used anywhere any of the individual predicates could have been used. So our task here is to say, it, if you want to take an arbitrary number of predicates, it's, it's hard. To, the, the problem is when you write out a stream pipeline, you can say dot filter, dot filter, dot filter. But how do you put a variable number of filters on there? Or if you have one AND operation, OK, you can take two predicates and turn them into one. But we want to take an arbitrary number of predicates and turn them into a single predicate. How can we do that? Uh, well, it turns out that all you need to do, all, the only operation you need is a single AND method that will combine two predicates into one. And we use reduction to do that. So just like we had a stream of big integers, and we multiplied them all together by putting the multiply operator between each value, we're going to take a bunch of predicates and put the AND operator between each one of them and reduce them into a single predicate. So here's a combined method that takes a list of predicates. And we start off, and so I wrote it out as a for loop, because I think it might be a little easier to, for people to understand this way. So we start off with our initial value. And so again, we talked about identity before. What's the identity for a predicate? So a predicate is something that returns, oh, excuse me, what's the identity for a predicate and the AND operator? So if you have some truth value and you AND it with something, what value is the identity there so that you always get that something back? It turns out that true is the identity value for AND over predicate. So if you take any value, AND it with true, you always get that same value back. So that's why the initial value of this, uh, this temporary predicate variable is a lambda expression, which is a predicate that always returns true. So we start off with that, and then we have a for loop over the list of predicates, and each time we AND it with the existing predicate and then store that back in the variable. And then at the end of the loop, we return that variable. So this is a for loop style way of taking a whole bunch of predicates and reducing them to a single predicate using the AND operation. OK, and so this is the exact equivalent way to do this using streams. So again, we take the list of predicates, turn them into a stream, and then reduce using the identity value of a predicate that always returns true, and then combine all the predicates using the AND operation. So this will take a whole bunch of predicates, AND them all together, and produce a single predicate that, that combines all of the input ones. So now we have a way to take a bunch of predicates and turn them into a single one. So if we return to the original example here, we take a list of predicates, and we want to filter a product through an arbitrary number of predicates. So how do we do that? The first thing we do is we take that list of predicates and combine it down to one. And so that's what the first line here does. And then we run the same stream pipeline. And all we need to do is pass that one single predicate, because now that's the combination of all of the predicates that were used as the input. Then we collect the products into a list and return that. OK, so it's a, novel, a slightly novel use of reduction here. So instead of reducing values like numbers, we're reducing functions by combining them all together. Everybody with me so far? <laughs> OK, time for another exercise. So, uh, so there's, another, there's another functional interface in Java called int unary operator. Uh, and so what that does is it is a it, is, it represents a function that uh, takes an int and returns an int. 
And so what we want to do is write a method that takes an arbitrary number of int unary operators and combines them into a single one. OK, now with predicates, there was a way to combine two predicates into one using the AND method. It turns out that int unary operator has a method called AND THEN. So that will take two int unary operators and then turn them into a single int unary operator that is a combination of the two. And then uh, the task is essentially to take an arbitrary number of int unary operators and combine them into a single one. And just for an example here, so this is, this is the exercise here. We want, we want a list of, uh, we're providing a list of uh, integer operations here. So there's a series of three lambdas in this list that uh, one that adds one to the input value, the second one multiplies the input value by two, and the third one adds three to the value. So if we take those three lambda expressions, which are int unary operators, combine them into a single one, and then we call that single operator with five, the result should be 15. And so you, it's, it's easy to see if you can do the arithmetic in your head. We start off with five, add one to get six, multiply by two to get 12, and then add three to get 15. So the challenge is to write a Java program that takes those, a list of int unary operators and then returns a single int unary operator that, that is a combination of those in order. Let me do that. Add for that? Type in. Oh, yeah, actually, why don't, okay. you, why don't you do that? Okay. I uh, should have an ID somewhere. Where is it? Oh, by the way, I've got some funny things to do. There was a pull request yesterday on the, on, on the first part. Where is it? It's here. So I don't know if the person who did the pull request uh, is in the room to, currently. Mm. Ah, it's not. Never mind. I really like pull request, and I'm going to accept this one just now. Yeah, merge pull request. Confirm merge. Well, thank you for making pull requests. One pull request time many people means a lot of contributions to open source. So you should really consider doing that every time you, you can do it. Is that the one where, like, we were working through the examples? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't check. Maybe it completely. No, yes. I thought you did check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, it was a fix on the test. <laughs> on the okay. test that was not right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I checked it yesterday. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Check yeah. it yesterday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it's nice. It's, it's always very nice when when I see people uh, providing pull requests for this kind of thing. I mean, it takes time to do that. Uh, okay, so th this is the code of yesterday, sorry, I'm missing exit presentation mode. This is not the one I want. I'm going to close this one and take this one, enter presentation mode. Please, that's fine. And my projects are here. So we are in a function combination, so I should have, this is the example of the predicates. And this is the example of the comparator. So I need to add code here to make the test run which should currently throw an ugly null pointer exception. But we all love null pointer yeah. exception. Yeah. They're my absolutely. favorite exception. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, same for me. Actually, that's not true. Interrupted exception is my favorite exception. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I need to combine this and uh, using reduction. So I guess that to, to use this reduce method, the, the idea is to use this reduce method. So I guess that to use this reduce method, I first need to create a stream out of these operators. It turns out it's a list, so I've got a nice and nifty stream method on the list interface. So I should, I should do it. And uh, do I need to map it or filter it? I don't think so. I should be able to call the reduce operator directly on it. Uh, actually, yeah, I, I first need to provide the first operator, which is going to be the identity element of the stuff. On the first step, I'm going to put null here. I, I know that it won't work, but well, I will think, think about it after that. And then, as you said it, those are my three operators, the first one, the second one, and the third one. And what I need to do is, is chain them, so just put mm -hmm. the and then method between them, just to produce the results. I think it should work. So this is, I'm going to take two operators, let us call it op1, op2, and then chain them 
using OP1 and then OP2. All right, and that, that should do it, really. That should do it. If I do it like that, I still need to think about this one, but if I do it like that, then, then it, should, it should be working. And here, this is a nice method, references, re method reference. We talked about that yesterday. And it's just another way of writing the lambda expression. If you are using IntelliJ or Eclipse, just select the lambda you want to convert to a method reference, yeah. and it should do the trick. Yeah, NetBeans has that. Too. Yes, uh, NetBeans too, of course. Of course, all the <laughs> oh yes, all the ideas can do that. Yeah, a couple a couple of claps from the uh, NetBeans crowd over here. In the yeah, corner. yeah, yeah. Well, NetBeans is a is, is a great idea too, and uh, you should definitely uh, use it, especially in uh, the Java EE space. NetBeans is really shining, I think. Uh, now I need to think. I need to be to be smart to to because if I if I just run it like that, it will not work. Why? Because as you mentioned it, this is in fact the seed value for the reduction. Right. In fact, th there is this value here, and then the values of the stream, and the end then between all those values. But what I could think about is that if this list of operators uh, is empty, what I expect to do is that uh, the, the, this combined operator apply as int should not modify the value, right? Um, if, if, if I do not have any operators in my list, mm -hmm. I expect not to modify the input value to produce the output. So I guess that this one should be the operator. It's going to be the operator that is returned if the list of operators here is empty. So this operator should be the operator that do not modify the input value. So something like that. I returns I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just just the identity unary operator. And now if I run the code, yes, the test is green. And I didn't have to cheat, so this is great. Do I have uh, a, an identity method or something? Identity function? Oh, yes. Yeah. I've got this identity factory method on the int unary operator. So I could even write it like that. Something like that. And even use a static import. Maybe to improve readability. That's nice. Do you like it? This... Uh, it's a matter of taste, I think. Some people like yeah, the names, I identity. Um, personally, when I see a lambda expression, I arrow I or T arrow T, it's like I immediately know what that means. I think that's idiomatic. Um, okay, whatever you prefer. Yeah, either way. I'm going to put it like that. Oops. So, so I think the interesting thing here is whenever you do a reduction, you have to think about what the identity value is yeah. for the operation you're reducing over. And, and sometimes that's a little subtle. And so, so certainly, um, if you remember your grade school arithmetic, right, they're, <laughs> they're the identity operators. And I, you know, it's one of these things where I remember learning this stuff in third grade or whenever it was. And then it's like, yeah, 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 it just kind of sits off in the corner. And then you learn functional programming, and all the stuff starts to come back, <laughs> right? So if you're reducing over addition, the identity value is zero. If you're reducing over multiplication, the identity value is one. And of course, if you get the identity wrong, right, if you start off with zero for the multiplicative identity, then you get the wrong yeah, result. You get null right? factorial. Yeah, or, or I, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's easy, make to, easy mistake to make. I've seen somebody use one as the identity operator for addition, or the identity value for addition, and of course, it, it totally screws things up. Yeah. Um, and so now when you're combining functions, here, you really have to think about it. Instead of that rote memorization of, yeah, 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 one is the identity value for multiplication, you have to say, if I'm combining functions, what's the identity function? Well, the identity function is a function that consumes a value and returns the same value. And I guess you just kind of have to know that. Yeah. Um, thinking, of with, thinking of the identity element of, as an element that will be produced in case of the element you want to reduce is empty, is also, um, I think, a right. nice way yeah. to have it. Uh, now you have to think that some operator do not have an identity element. Mm -hmm. And it's the case for operators as max, min, average, that do not have an identity element. And that, that's quite painful because mm, you cannot really provide the identity element yeah. when you're doing the reduction. Uh, basically, well, it leads to optionals. <laughs> well, no, so for, for, for max and min, if you have a limited domain, you know, you can, yeah. you can sometimes find the, the identity element is the one at the end of the range, 
right? So the identity element for max might be, you know, if you're doing max over integers, it's integer.min value. Because mm -hmm. for, for any, any given value, it's going to be greater than integer. Any, any valid integer value is going to be greater than integer.min value. So if you apply the max operator, it's all the same. Uh, but mathematically, of course, that's, yeah. that's not true. If you're using big integer, then it's arbitrary representation or ar arbitrary magnitude. So there's no, there's not necessarily any, any end value that you mm -hmm. can use there. And you need to make sure that you are not going to convert your integer into a long, for instance. Right. Because if you do that, then the integer.min value will not, that's trick, true. Will not yeah. work anymore. So sometimes you can do it, but you're, that's, a, yeah. that's a good point. There are some functions for which um, there is no identity value. Yeah. All right. Shall we carry on? Okay. All right. So let's go back to the slides here. Okay. So that was the setup for the problem. And then that's the, uh, that's the, the solution. solution that Jose came up with. Okay. So let's move on to the, to the next segment here. Um, all right, so now let's talk about collectors. Uh, let's see, how are we doing it? Half, half an hour left, is yeah. that right? Okay. Until coffee break. Yeah. Okay, uh, so now, so there's a rich family of collectors. So there's a set of, uh, uh, set of things you can put at the end of a stream. They're called terminal operations. Uh, and so there are things like for each, which is easy one. There's, uh, we've seen collecting two lists and, and set. But if you look at, there's, there's, there's a, a very large family of um, collector implementations already in the JDK. And so there, uh, I think there's a lot to go through. Um, a lot of people will just say, well, I know how to collect into a list or I know how to collect into a set, but there's an extremely rich set of other collectors there. So we, we're going to be taking a tour through uh, several of those uh, in this next segment here. So the first one I wanted to start off with is collectors.toMap. Okay, so a stream is a stream of, it's a sequence of individual elements, and collectors.toMap will take that stream of individual elements and produce a map. Now, how does it do that? So it takes, in its simplest form, there are several overloads here, we'll just talk about the two arc version. It starts off by taking two functions, one that takes the input element and will transform it into a key, and the other that takes the input element and transform it into a value. And then now that you have the key and the value, that turns into a map entry and that's inserted into the destination map. And so once all of the values of the stream are consumed, then you have a bunch of key value pairs, those all get loaded into the map, and then the map is returned as a result of collectors.toMap. All right, let's show an example of that. So let's start off with our alphabet list again and stream it into a collector using the toMap collector. And so we're heavily using static imports here. So the way to write this out longhand is collectors.toMap. But as you'll see, we're going to be making very heavy use of collectors in the next section. So we've statically imported all of the collectors, uh, uh, collectors methods. So basically, we, this takes every input element and runs it through the toMap collector. And so each element is a word, alpha, bravo, charlie, and so forth. And we take the word, so, so there are two functions here. The first one is the key extractor, and the second one is the value extractor, or the key function and the value function. So the first one takes the word and takes a substring from zero to one. So what that does is it gets us the first letter. And then the value function takes the word and simply returns the word. So that the word itself becomes the value of the key. And so the resulting map looks like this. So A is the key and alpha is the value, B is, is the next key, bravo is the value, and so forth. And so you know, it runs all the way to Z, so I just didn't put them all on the, on the slide here. So that's pretty simple. So we have two key functions, one, one that, uh, sorry, a key function and a value function, and the, the, key, um, the key function turns the word into the first letter and the value function leaves the word unchanged. All right, now let's try it with a different set of input. Okay, so this is the same code. It does exactly the same thing, but in instead, oh, we, uh, actually, we made another mistake. This should be taking the sonnet instead of the alphabet. Oh, yeah. So if we take the, the lines of Shakespeare's sonnet and run it through the same 
collector's code using the same key function and value function from to map, then what happens? All right, well, we get this exception here. Exception, illegal state exception, duplicate key B, attempted merging values, but as the riper should by time decease, but thou contracted to thine own bright eyes. I, I think that's the first time I've ever seen Shakespeare in uh, exception message. Yes, uh, I th so, I th I th you, you should make a JSR out of that you know, to add some random Shakespeare quotations, <laughs> quotes. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. <laughs> the error messages. So, so okay. So there's something going on here. So if you, if you, well, I'm, I'm not going to bother to find the the, uh, the the input here. But if you look at the lines of the Shakespeare, there are two lines that start with B, and so this message is very explicit here. It says, okay, so remember we're taking the first letter of of each line. And this says there's a duplicate key, right? So we start first, there's, there's one line in there, it starts with a B, and we, so we put that in the map. And then later on, we come to another line that starts with B, and it says, oh, there's, a, there's already a key B in the map. And there's a value in the map already, which is one line, which is, but as the riper should time decease. But I have another one here, I have another line that starts with B, which is, but thou contracted to thine own bright eyes. So the two arg two map collector does not allow there to be duplicate keys. And so, so this is an interesting point here. We could, have, we could have designed something in a different way to say, oh, okay, well, just, just ignore duplicates or just you know, have the last one wins or something like that. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a better way of handling it, which, which I'm going to describe for you. But the point here is that the, the two arg version of two map is useful for inputs where you know the keys are going to be unique. And so notice in the alphabet list, that's the, the, the words are from A to Z. And so if we take the first letter, we know those are unique. So, so we can just put those straight into a map. But if we do the same thing with a sonnet, we have this extra, extra decision to make, which is what do we do with duplicates? Okay, so let's see. Uh, so if it's not unique, it throws an exception. Now, so there's a variation, or there's an overload of the two map collector. So it takes three arguments. The key function, the value function, and then the third argument is a merge function. And the merge function is given the task of saying, okay, they're duplicate keys, and, they're, and the, those keys have different values associated with them. So the merge function is responsible for dealing with those, uh, those values. Um, all right, so I'll show the code, code that does that here. So here is an example where we have two map using the uh, three arg form. So it's the same thing where we take the line and uh, take the first letter as the key, take the line itself as the value, and then the third function says, okay, um, I'm given two lines that have duplicate keys, and I'm just going to take the first one. So we have line one, comma, line two, arrow, line one. So we're going to throw away one of the lines. And so that's, that's sort of, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's sort of merging, but we're saying, okay, well, first one wins, second one loses. And so this is the result from that. Um, so a Shakespeare sonnet has 14 lines, uh, and there are only eight lines left here. So clearly there are a bunch of duplicates that have been set aside. All right, so let's look at a variation here where the merge function is instead the last version, uh, the last one wins. So here, instead of line one, line two, arrow, line one, we return line two instead. And so the result is, again, eight lines out of the 14, but it's different set of lines because we're choosing, uh, choosing different order. Um, but most of the time, you don't want to take the first or the second, you actually want to, to take the two values and, and do some logical merging on them somehow, or perform some computation on both of those values that results in, um, that results in some actual combined or merged value. So that's the subject of the next exercise, which is a variation on the previous one, which is to create a map using the lines of the sonnet. The key is, again, as in the previous ones, the first letter of each line and the value is the line itself, except the task is to write a merge function that concatenates the line, the, line, the, the duplicate lines with a new line in between. 
You want right. yeah, to sure. do some coding there, Jose? Absolutely. I need my glasses, sorry. <coughs> we should, should we give people time to, how do you want yeah. to work on this? Maybe, maybe we can check the, the previous code here. Because basically, I think that this is this is the, the skeleton of the code that should be written. Right. And, uh, well, what is not correct in this code compared to the other specification is that the merge function is not uh, the expected function right. there. So if you, th this example is already in a, in, a, in a GitHub code that you that you've downloaded, so you can go from there, and then well, instead of choosing the first line or the second one, try to find how to duplicate to um, to concatenate them with a new line in between. Maybe I can begin by uh, finding where is the code here? Oh, that's really big. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> I think it kind of Maybe. messed up. Ah, okay, that's why. Let me, let me go back. Yeah. All right. So this is the two map. And the example is... Uh, is it this one? It should be this one. Yeah, th this test shows the the illegal state exception that we just showed in the slide. Duplicate B, etc. With the try, so now maybe I can go from there, from there. Ah, this is this is the one. This is the 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 this is the result I expect to have. So maybe I can just copy paste this code here from the sonnet. So this is the collectors dot map collector that takes the first uh, character as a string from the line to get the key. The line here that could be also written as function dot identity. Maybe I can write it here real quick if you if you like this way of writing that. And then here I should be concatenating the two lines, right? So something like that. Line one plus line two. But then I need to add, sorry, this new line in between. Ah. Something like that. New lines are always a pain because you have a Mac yeah. with your own new lines. I've got a Windows machine with my own new line mm -hmm. and we, they don't talk to each other. <laughs> So I've got this nifty function in a system class that is going to give me the line separator that is the right one on either machine, whether you're using a Mac, a PC, or or, um, or a Linux machine. But now I put backslash n here. <laughs> so I guess that I should put, be putting backslash n here either. <laughs> Here also, just to make sure ah. <laughs> that it's going to work. So if I run this code, this code should pass. Yes. If I if I put the let me let me just check it out. System dot dot line separator. Run this test again. Ah, it's failing. Yeah. Yes, this is the this is <laughs> this is what I expected. And by the way, th this is the, the, the assertion I'm using in this test is the, the ResearchJ assertion framework. If you don't know this framework, it's really a great framework. You, everybody should be using it, I think. And there is, but we can't really use it here, but there is a way in this framework to compare strings by normalizing um, new lines and new line characters. So we can compare strings and have them equal even if they are not exactly the same. All right, so that th I think that makes it for, for this for this example. Okay, uh, so we did get a question on on some of this. Um, so do we have questions? Yeah, well, oh, I think great. there's this this one right here about ordering, which uh, ah, yeah, I, I think great. is significant, right? Absolutely. So, um, so the question is, uh, does stream guarantee the order of elements? And this is significant because uh, I said first wins and last wins, or or in, in this case. You know, in the solution, we concatenated the elements in a particular order, right? Mm -hmm. So are they guaranteed to come out in a particular order? And so the answer is maybe. Um, so, so in this case, the answer actually is yes. The stream can have 
but does not always have a notion of order. And so if it depends on the source of the stream. And so the, if you read the documentation, this is referred to as encounter order. I'm not entirely sure why it's called that, but if you see the term encounter order, that is the ordering of the elements uh, with respect to each other. Uh, and so a list is ordered, um, a list in Java. Clearly, uh, the first element is zero and if you have n elements in a list, the last element is n minus one. And so if you stream the elements of a list, they will come out in that order. And so then it does become uh, sensible to write merge functions. So if you have, you know, if you have, you're streaming from a list and you do a variety of things and you're collecting, you can have terminal operations such as the merge function of a collector that do respect the order. So you get two values and you know that the first value occurred before the second one in the stream. And that might be significant to your, comp uh, to your computation. Now there are other streams that are not ordered. So if you stream out of a, a hash set, for instance, the iteration order of a hash set is not defined. So you can, the, you know, certainly the elements will come out in some order, but exactly what that order is, is not, is not defined. And so that's, um, that's a case where the resulting stream is unordered. And in fact, the, uh, there are cases in the streams code where uh, it will take, it, it does, it, the streams code has to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that things are kept in order. And if things are unordered, then there are cases where it can say, oh, since, since the stream is not ordered, I can use a shortcut that avoids doing the extra work of keeping things in order. So uh, anyway, so the short answer is streams can have order based on the um, source of the stream. And then there are also, there are also some intermediate operations that will, um, break, the order. That will break the order. And yeah, an order, I think it is. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, an, there's, there's one called unordered, but I think there's some, some other examples. Well, I can't think of it. Well, if you, if, you do a, if you do a flat mapping, it will break the order of the upcoming stream. Well, no, actually it, it won't. Be, well, yeah, the, so, so, if you have, so, if, so if you have elements A and B in a stream and you flat map them to yeah. A1 through A4 and B1 through B5, all of, the, all of the A elements will occur before all of the B elements. And so relative order is still preserved. Okay. And I think in that case, the stream result from flat map, if that is ordered, then that order will be preserved in, through the output stream. Mm -hmm. But there are... Yeah, so uh, there, there are some cases where ordering is not preserved in the, yeah. in the stream. You, you have to make sure to make the difference between ordered and sorted, which right. is not the same. A yes. list is ordered, and uh, if, you, if you sort it using, using a sorting comparator, then it becomes sorted. Right. It doesn't make sense to sort something that is not ordered because you cannot keep the order, so you sort it and yeah. you, then you lose the order, so you're not sorted anymore. Yeah. But there is a difference between bo both notions. And a stream by default is not sorted. There was another question on the, the identity elements. Um, ah, right. Does it mean that you cannot use operator or function that does not have identity value for reduction in a stream? So the answer is no, you can use uh, functions that do not have identity values. And this is the case for the mean, the max, and the average. Right. You got an average method on the, the streams mm -hmm. of numbers, uh, in stream and uh, long stream. And there's also an overload of the reduce a function that does not that do not take the first uh, parameter, which is the identity uh, element, and if you do that, this reduce method will return an optional, meaning that if you are reducing an empty stream using this reduce method, uh, it will return you with an empty optional if instead of trying to create some kind of buggy uh, identity element, right. because the reduction of the empty stream should always be uh, the identity element of the reduction operation. If you don't have that, there are many things that are going to break in a stream API. Okay. Like parallelism, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is the solution, and this is the this is the output here. So you can yeah. see that uh, each first letter is uh, is mapped to a value with the lines concatenated uh, and indented a little bit, so that uh, so that you can see where they are. Um, and uh, so that's the solution. Okay. So let's move on to uh, another collector called grouping by. Who, ne who never oh. heard about the grouping by collector? 
Well, okay. A fair number so, of people so, have not heard about grouping by. Yeah. So, so uh, all right. So grouping by also produces a map. And I say here, it's, sort of, it's, it's a fancy way of collecting a map from a stream. Uh, so, so the two map methods, we showed two, uh, two different overloads, one that, one that uh, maps directly into keys and values, and the other that maps into keys and values and also merges duplicate values. And so grouping by is, is you know, it, it also does collection of stream elements into a map, um, but it does it in, in a very, very particular way. And so it seems, it seems kind of complicated, but it turns out to be extremely useful. So the, the simplest, and there are also multiple overloads of grouping by which, which make it more complicated. But we'll start off with the simplest one. And so, in fact, all, all of the grouping by collectors first take what is called a classifier function. And that's, that's basically the same as um, a key function in, in 2MAP. But basically, so we have the um, stream elements, and they come in, and the first thing that happens is it runs, it's run through the classifier function. And the result of the classifier function is a key that is used in the map. All right, now, as with the two map collector, there's the possibility of duplicates. So what happens? So what grouping by does is it takes the values directly out of the stream and then sticks them into a list, which is the value corresponding to the key. So the result is we take a stream of elements of type T that runs through the classifier function to get a key of type K, and then the values that, that correspond to that key are, are put into a list. And so if there are multiple values, then of course you get multiple, if, you, if there are multiple values that are mapped to the same key, then those end up getting put into the list. So you might have an arbitrary number of elements in the list. Okay, so let's run, uh, run through an example here. Um, actually, this is not an example. This is, this is writing out what grouping by does using the two map collector. And the example is, let's classify the words of the alphabet list by length. So, so we've already talked about the two map collector. And so this is the three argument form of two map. So let's set aside grouping by for a moment. And, and let's say we wanted to say, let's classify the words by word length. Uh, and then each word gets, we want to get put into a list uh, that, you know, in, into a list that corresponds to words of that particular length. So the key function here uh, is the first, the first function, uh, the first argument to two map. And so we take the word and call length on it. And that results in an integer. So the key, the key type of the map is integer. And then and this is a little bit, this is a little bit of a problem here because we need to create a list, but we know we're going to add to it. So we have to, we have to use arrays.asList to add that to a new array list. So that's why the value function is a little, little more complicated. And then now there's this merge function, which is suppose I have um, two, if I have two words that have the same length and they get put into lists, how do we merge two lists? Well, we take, we take all the elements from one list and call add all on it to put them into the first list and then return that one. And so this is kind of complicated, but it turns out this is, this, is really, this is really something you do fairly frequently. Uh, it's probably easier if I just show the result here. Um, so here we take the alphabet list and categorize them by word length. And so here you can just see the list of all the word, the alphabet words that have four letters and then five, six, seven, and eight. And so, uh, and notice again, so the, again, this, uh, the, go back, going back to the previous question, notice that these are still in alphabetical order relative to all the others in the same list because the input stream was, uh, the, the, the stream that was sent to grouping, uh, grouping by, or stream that was sent to the two map collector is ordered. And so they get put into the result list inside the map and they retain their ordering. So this is the result we want, and the, the code for doing this is kind of complicated, and it's easy to get wrong. And so it turns out that grouping by, the grouping by collector, 
oh, again, this is the re repeat of the, the code from the previous, the previous slide. On the, the first snippet is a repeat of the code from the, from the earlier slide. The bottom snippet is the equivalent using the grouping by collector. And so it's much simpler because this is, a, this is an operation you, you, you end up having to do fairly frequently, and it's quite useful. So in, in the simplest form, the grouping by collector just takes the classifier function. And if you use it that way, then the values uh, that, that all correspond to the same key get, you know, they just get copied straight into a list. Uh, and so anyway, so if you use this grouping by code, then the result is exactly the same, same result here, which is, which is a pretty useful result. So you get a nice way of classifying the values of a stream into a map. All right, so we have an exercise here, which is collect the lines of the sonnet into a map. The keys are the first letter of each line. So we've done that before. So yeah. that's the classifier function. And then the values are the list of lines beginning with that letter. Uh, okay, that, that should be pretty easy. You think so? Hmm. Should I write it by hand or sh can I use, can I use the grouping by collector for this one? Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> that's the second time, right? Yeah, I think you have to take oh, it no, on present. It's okay. Is it? That's, okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so I've got the alphabet, I've got the sonnet, grouping by, this is the first example in the sl from the slides, and this is the to-do, then I should be running this one. Yeah. Uh, and it's not working because it throws this null pointer exception that we all love. All right. So the first step, of course, is to take the sonnet, to stream it using this stream method from the, from the, the collection interface. And then I can collect the result using this collectors.grouping by. The, as you mentioned, it, uh, we, we didn't put the collectors dot in front of, of all those, those um, factory methods, but in fact, all those methods are in the collectors factory method. So there are different versions of the grouping by uh, collector. And the first one that is the most easy, easy one to use is the one that takes the key extractor. If I do this, I can see the three versions of, of the of this method, the three overloads, and the overload I want to use is the first one that takes the classifier as a parameter. The classifier is a function that takes one element of the stream as a parameter, so it's one line of the sonnet. The sonnet is a, is a list of lines, in fact, so it's a line, and I want to classify them using the first character of this line. Mm -hmm. So it's just line dot substring and takes the first character, something like that. And this returns just the map of the string. The strings are just this key that has been extracted here. And the list of strings, all the strings that begin with this same character gathered uh, as, a, as a string, as a list, sorry. So if I run this code, I would have a green test. I, I could, maybe we, we can, uh, do you want to show this, this now? No, okay, we, we have um, downstream collectors after that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. there's more, there's more, uh, there's more, more to come add on, on, to this, on this topic. All right, so I think we're good to go. It's, yeah. This is just basic use of the grouping by collector. Let's go back to the slides. Okay. Um, all right, and that's the solution, and that's, pretty much exactly what uh, Jose typed in a moment mm -hmm. ago. And this is the result. Uh, so here, um, you know, the keys are the first letter of the line, and then the values are the list of lines that have that first letter. And you can see that in the output. Okay, so it looks like we're coming up on break. Yeah. And we do have one question here, okay. uh, which I'll answer, and then I think we'll, we'll go to break. Uh, so the question was about uh, ordering. And so we were talking about ordering before, and I called it encounter order, um, the ordering of the stream. And the question was, if you run the stream in parallel, how does that affect mm. encounter order? And the answer is that parallel processing will affect the order in which different threads process the elements, but when the results are returned, if, uh, <clears throat> if the input had an encounter order, then the output will also have the same encounter order. 
And so that's, 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 it's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, presentation here, but parallel processing, since things, are, since things are farmed out onto different threads, the threads can do the operations in any order, but when reassembly is done, the ordering is preserved from input to output. And so the encounter order, the output is, uh, well, the encounter order of the output will reflect the encounter order of the input if the input had an order to begin with. Um, so I, th I think that's pretty much all I can say about that at this point. You can have a very large... So if, uh, you, if, yeah. I, if I understand okay. well, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I have side effects in my functions and <laughs> things right. like that, I should not rely on the old order in which the elements are processed if I go parallel. Is right, that that's, that's, a, that's yeah. an excellent point, right? So, so, uh, so let's, let's, take a, let's th imagine a simple stream pipeline that, that maps input strings to, from lowercase to uppercase, right? Okay. So you have a list, it gets all split up and farmed out to a bunch of, of different threads. Turned in, each thread will do its uppercasing on different words at different times, but the, when the results are reassembled into the result list, that result list will have the same order as the input list. Now, that's an excellent point. If you have side effects in your map, we right? should, so we should, you should you not. Should be doing not. That. This is why you should not have side effects, right? So the example I chose, which is if you take the input, turn it to uppercase, and produce the output, the output depends only on the input. If that's the case, then that will work with parallel processing. But suppose I have some weird mapping function that you know changes things to uppercase and then modifies some data structure somewhere. There, the ordering across the threads is definitely not guaranteed. And so if you have side effects, you either, you know, either you must make very sure that the side effects that you're performing are order independent, or you're going to have data races. Absolutely. So anyway. Okay, uh, I think it's break time. Yeah. Uh, how, much, how much time for break? Half an hour? Until 11.15? Until, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so there, is, there should be coffee and... Uh, and oh, we'll yeah. be, oh, yes. We'll be talking about downstream collectors after that. Yeah, so there's a way of composing multiple collectors to provide some uh, very interesting computations. All right, so see you in a little over, a little, little less than half an hour. Okay, see you. Cascading okay. collectors. Okay, welcome the back. Next topic. All right, I hope everybody got coffeeed up. Um, or tea, or oranges. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so in this next segment, we'll be talking about a way that you can cascade collectors together. It's a way of combining them to produce uh, a lot more uh, number of flexible combinations. So when we were talking about grouping by before, uh, it, it does a lot, but it's also, it's also very particular in what it does, right? So it takes the, the, the single argument grouping by takes one key function, or the classifier function, and then it puts the values into a list. And sometimes it's exactly what you want, and so great, you just call grouping by. Um, but sometimes you, you know, sometimes that's not what you want, and so you might want to have a variation on it. Uh, so there's another overload of the grouping by collector that takes the classifier function as before, but then it takes a second argument, which is another collector. And so we call that the downstream collector. And so this downstream collector is responsible for taking the values that end up in the same classification and doing something with them. And so what, what does it do with them? Well, it's a collector. So it can do anything that a collector can do. So it's, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, so let's start off with a simple example. So one is there's a, there's a collector uh, called collectors.counting. And so what that will do is it will take all the input elements that it's given and return a count of the number of input elements it was given as a long value. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's actually quite analogous to the stream terminal oper operation stream.count. So if you say stream.count, that will count the elements of a stream. If you use the counting collector as the downstream collector, then it will provide a count of the number of elements that it is given. So let's run in, through an example of that. So here, we'll start with our input again, and we will group the, uh, we'll group the lines of the sonnet by their first letter, so we've done that before. And then as the downstream collector, we will use this collector called collectors.counting. And so instead, so it's grouping by, just like before, but instead of the values being a list of the lines that match this classification, it's the 
count of the number of lines that match this classification. So here, this is the result of it. So there's one line that begins with P, two that begins with A, um, four that begin with T, and so forth. So that's what collectors of thought counting does if you use it as the downstream collector. Now notice these are all long values. So it's one of the things is wherever we're introducing new, new things that are, that are integral values or trying to use longs because there are a lot of places in the API that use int currently. And uh, strange as it may, may seem, there are places where people are bumping into the uh, 2 billion limit of an int. So where possible, we're starting to use longs in the API. All right, so this is, this is collectors.counting as a downstream collector. You can actually use collectors.counting as, as the direct argument to a collect call, but it's really, it's really not useful to do that because you have stream.count. But uh, the point here is that collectors.counting is downstream of the classification. So you have values coming in the stream. They get classified into the different map keys, and then the value is the count of the number of elements in each classification. So, all right, so then there's another downstream collector which is quite useful, which is called collectors.mapping. And so this is interesting because it's analogous to the stream.map intermediate operation, except that it's useful as a downstream collector. So this is, this is kind of interesting in that collectors.mapping is itself useful at it it's useful as a downstream collector but it also takes another argument which is another downstream collector so so why is that so if you look at the stream map operation the the map operation is an intermediate operation so it takes an element from upstream and sends another element downstream so that's what collectors dot mapping does so it receives the results from some outer collector, in this case, grouping by, it does a mapping operation, and then it produces a result. Well, where does that result go? Well, it sends it to its own downstream collector. So we're, we're sort of doing these little like stream-like pipelines within the collector framework here. All right, so let's show an example of that. Um, so the first part of the code here is our original grouping by code. So that, that has a classifier function that takes the first letter of each line. And since it's the simple grouping by version, the result is the, the value is a list of lines that match the classifier. All right, so what we can do is we can provide to the grouping by collector a downstream collector, which is this mapping collector and what we've done here is we've provided an implementation of some functions that we're providing to the mapping collector that implement the same thing as what grouping by does by default. So what mapping does is it takes an input and it runs it through this function we're giving. So the function, we're, the function we've handed it is the identity. It takes a line and just returns the same line. So we're not transforming it at all, but we have the opportunity to do so, but in this case we're not. And then, with the result of that function, we are collecting those into a list. And since this is done for the values within each classification, this ends up being exactly the same as grouping by uh, without, without the downstream collector at all. So what we're doing here is we're just implementing the same old grouping by using the mapping downstream collector that does exactly the same thing. So now you, you wouldn't necessarily want to write this code like this because, you know, why bother? Why, you know, we're just adding complication and it's not changing the meaning of, of what grouping by does. But what this does is expose some underlying structure of the collector's framework. And so now we can make some variations in what grouping by does. Uh, so in particular, there are two things going on here. We can change the function that is used to transform the elements coming in into something else. And the second thing is that we can either collect them into something other than a list or we can reduce them. So we can take all those values and combine them into a single value. All right, so here's an example of that. All right, so we'll, it's again, we're starting off with a sonnet and classifying each line 
based on its first letter. And now for the downstream collector of grouping by, we are using the mapping collector. And so the transformation function we're applying here is string colon colon length. So we're taking each line that comes into this classification. We're saying, okay, replace it with its length and then pass it to the downstream collector of mapping. And in this case, the downstream collector of mapping is to list. So then what we're doing is we're taking the lengths and putting them into a list. And you can see the result here. So the map is for, for the first letter of the sonnet, uh, the first letter of each line of the sonnet, the number of lines that have that same first letter. Or, sorry, a list of lengths of lines that have that first letter. So previously, for instance, we knew that there were four lines that began with T. And so what we're doing is we're taking the line, taking its length, and then putting the lengths into a list. So now our map consists of the key being T, and then we have a list of lengths. And so that's what the result map looks like. So here we can start to introduce some, some knobs that we can turn and play with and vary the, uh, uh, vary the exact behavior of grouping by. All right, so it's time for another exercise. So here again, we are grouping the lines of the sonnet by the first letter, and the task is to take the first word of each line in the group and put them into a set. And so again, let's just use this, this very simple word splitting expression here. We take the string, split it using this regular expression, uh, and, and then since that results in an array, we'll take the first element of the array by using array index zero. So you want to do some coding, Jose? Yes. Oh, yes, sure. <clears throat> so in the meantime, during the pause or during the break or just, just during the first uh, session, somebody made another pull request on the... Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> I only need to, to take a look at it and uh, make sure be before accepting it. All right, so we are still in the grouping by stuff. Hmm, cascading characters, right. And there's only one example here, which is this one. So, all right, I'm going to, it all starts with the streaming of the sonnets, right? So sonnet.stream, and then collect the result in this wonderful character called grouping by. The, the classifier, the first function is called the classifier, it's the first letter. So I'm going to take the line, uh, because the sonnet is a, is a list of lines, and just do the same thing as we did uh, before the break, which is take the first parameter of the line. Um, I guess the compiler is confused because of the return type, which is not the right one uh, still. And now what I need to do, if I just do it like that, right, I can ask my IDE to help me in that perspective, is that it just returns the classical classical map of string, which is the key, and list of string, which are the values bound to that key. Now, if I pass a downstream collector here, it is going to change the signature of this, uh, of this call and change the, um, the type of the map, basically. And what I want to do here is to extract the first word of a line, and I'm going to copy-paste this code here. Uh, and put this in a list, is that it? So I have a, a str for each value, each value is a list of line that I can see as a list of line that is streamed and then collected using this downstream collector. It's a model that I can have in mind, I guess it's correct to, to do that. So what I want to do is to transform this map and extract the first word of each map. So this transformation is basically a map operation. So I should be using the collectors.mapping uh, collector to do that. So collectors dot mapping. The collectors dot mapping takes the mapping function that is going to take the line and oh, I should call this line and split the line and extract the first word. But it also takes a second argument. If I check, I only have one version of the mapping collector that necessarily take a second argument, which is itself a downstream collector. And this downstream collector from the specification should be creating a set here. 
So I've got the collectors.toList that is going to create a set, mm -hmm. and I also have the collectors.toSet to create a set. And by the way, I also have a collector collectors the two collection that takes a supplier that is going to create the collection I need to create if I want to use, <coughs> for instance, homemade collections or things like that. So here I can pass a further downstream collector, which is the two set collector. And now it seems that, yes, the compiler is lost because this type is not correct anymore. Um, in fact, the correct type is this one because I have transformed the list of strings previously to a set of strings thanks to the use of this two set collector. Uh, is the test going to be green? I wouldn't bet too much on that. <laughs> oh, it is. Great. I should have bet something. <laughs> uh, all right, what, what, what may look confusing when we are trying to cascading collectors like that is that every time we want to cascade a collector, we, want to, we need to add a downstream collector inside another collector. It is in fact something that we nest. We nest a collector inside a collector, inside a collector, inside a collector. Here we have a collector, inside a collector, inside a collector. And since this is itself a downstream collector, I could continue to nest more collectors, you know, to cascade, cascade right. more collectors on that. It's probably one of the, the things that makes the code, the code uh, a little hard to read when you do this kind of thing too much. Uh, but it's, it is the way the collector API has been designed, so it has to be, to be written like that. I think we do go. Yeah, I think yeah? so. Yeah, I think one. So, so certainly one of the when you work with this area of the code, you can get into uh, very deeply nested collectors. Yeah. And so sometimes what's useful is to extract a collector into a variable. Yeah. You um, can do that. Oh, if what you want to show that? that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the idea is he's going yeah, to do I, it yeah, for me. Okay. I can put this in a collector, and uh, and. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> discover well, the nice signature of the collector <laughs> interface, <laughs> which is which is not necessarily that easy uh, to understand. So this collector, what what does it does? What does it do? It just map to first word yeah. in a set, something like that. If I want yeah. to do that, if I want to do it like that. Well, if this were another talk, we could use var there. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's going to work? <laughs> of Actually, course. Let's see. Yeah. Ah! No, it's so Ah, the, yeah, yes, no, because it's no. using the set of string yeah, to know needs, that this is a string. It needs. Uh, it, you, you need. Uh, you need. It needs more type information there. So. And oh, if, wow. I, if I, if I, if I, hang on. If I put a string here, is it going to work? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> okay. Too bad. <laughs> oh, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, your, it's your go. I didn't just use the var okay. stuff. All right. All right. Back to the slides. Then. Yes, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Don't you think it looks like JavaScript? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> I'll be talking about var on Thursday. <laughs> and JavaScript too? No. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, this is the solution that Jose came up with, and you can see that the the output here is a mapping from the first letter of each line to, uh, and you can't you can't tell um, it's hard, it's kind of hard to tell, but the the values on the right are actually sets. Um, turns out that there are two words of the of the sonnet or two lines of the sonnet that begin with but, and so since since these are sets, then you uh, the word but is deduplicated there in the in the B classification. So those really are sets in the output. Uh, okay, so kind of a recap here. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different stuff you can do. When you cascade collectors, uh, there are a set of uh, collectors that are kind of analogous to the intermediate stream operations. We showed collectors.mapping. There's also collectors.filtering and collectors.flat mapping, and they oh. have from nine. Uh, yes, I think those were. Yeah, I think those were added. Yeah. Filtering and flat mapping were added in JDK nine, um, and so uh, and so those take the same uh, arguments as the stream, corresponding stream operations. Filtering takes. Uh, I guess it takes a predicate and a downstream, and then yeah. flat mapping takes a function that returns a stream, 
and it also takes it downstream. Um, and then there's, there are other collectors that are analogous to the terminal stream operations. So we talked about um, counting already. Um, there are all the ones we've covered so far. There's two list, two set, to map. There's grouping by, so you can use grouping by as a downstream collector itself. Uh, and what this results is, uh, um, if you use grouping by with a downstream collector of another grouping by, you get a nested map. Uh, and sometimes that's useful. Uh, it's it's kind of you know, it's kind of complicated, but sometimes it's one of those things where if you're if you're solving a problem and you you want to have a map of maps that you can use a nested grouping by and it works quite well. Um, in JDK 10, I think we also added collectors to unmodifiable list set and map, um, and so those return instances of the same things as list.of, set.of, and map.of. Um, there's also collectors dot reducing if you want to do a reduction operation while you're while you're sending uh, elements uh, downstream inside a collector. Uh, and then there's also uh, joining, which is just like um, stream. Oh, no, sorry, there's no corresponding thing there. But, but what joining does is it takes strings and internally it uses a string builder to do the concatenation. And so that avoids uh, a lot of excess copying. And so uh, I guess we just have an example of that here. Um, so if we, if we want to group by, group the sonnet by, sorry, group the lines of the sonnet by first letter, which is what we've been doing a lot, and then join those into uh, a single string separated by a line separator, we can write it very simply using, using joining, using the joining collector as the downstream collector of grouping by. What's maybe worth mentioning about the joining character is that it's only working on streams of strings and not right. streams of T. So you, especially if you want to use it as a downstream character, you really need to make sure that the values of the map are string themselves. And if they are not, then you can use the joining character as the downstream of a mapping character That's that right. will do some kind of object to string or things, some things like that. Right. Okay, and then so you can see the result of this here. So we've taken the lines and uh, joined them with, um, uh, you know, separated by new lines. And so, yeah. so this is, this is a, a somewhat easier way to do, I think, one of the exercises we've done previously hmm. is to use the joining collector. Okay, so uh, we have another exercise here. And so here it's generate a frequency table of letters in the wow. sonnet. Okay, so what's a frequency table? All right, so, so we're saying the letters. So what we want to do is we want to take the text of the sonnet, which is a sequence of lines, and then we can use this expand helper method that we used before, which is to split up each line into strings of individual characters. But then we want to get a frequency table. So that is a map from a letter to the number of times that letter occurs. So there's a bunch of things going on here. So we're gonna be using flat map, we're gonna be using grouping by and counting all in one stream expression. So I think this will be an interesting exercise for people to bite off and chew. Yeah. If, are, are people still following on their laptops? Uh, can we get a show of hands? People wanna do this? Oh, a lot of people. So, okay, okay. well, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, let, give people a chance to, uh, um, to, to, yeah, to, to think work about on it a little bit. Little, if, yeah. yeah. There are methods on a string class to stream the, the string, the letters of the string mm -hmm. in a stream. So maybe maybe they can be used in this. Oh, that's that's that's, that's right. Well, well, that's actually, a small hint. That's that's inside of expand. Oh yeah, all right. Yeah, so expand uh, will take a string and expand it into code points. Mm. Um, yeah. So once you've done that, you got a stream of letters, basically. But what you want to do is to count the number of times each letter mm -hmm. appears in that stream. Mm. That that's, looks like it's a job for the grouping by. <laughs> Flat map, grouping by comes yeah. just after that. <clears throat> yeah, I think we've covered everything in the solution. It's just that combining them in a particular yeah. way is is the uh, uh, is what makes this uh, makes this exercise a little bit um, 
a little bit interesting. Yeah. So I see a few people who are sort of heads down. I don't know if that means they're sleeping or they're working on their code. But, uh, or they could be tweeting yeah. about, oh, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just attending this wonderful talk with how, yeah. how they call those guys. <laughs> Tell me, Venkat something? No, Venkat yeah. is the other room. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to start writing the code? Okay. Yeah. Can't have too much dead time in here. That's the... All right. So where is my ID? It's here. I don't know why. Why is it? I think that. it just takes a. It takes a little time for it to yeah, yeah. Uh, update the update the screen resolution. Yeah. Or but please be nice. Do something. Ah, okay. There we go. Maybe I should try to <laughs> ping something on the screen yeah. so that. All right. So do I have it here? I, mean, I didn't get rid of this test. I did not. So okay. I'm going to do something real quick. Oh, this this, this is getting collector. It seems to me that I forgot to uh, ah. to prepare anything for the for this okay. test, but never mind. Okay, so we got the sonnet. So we are going to to stream the line. This is a stream. I'm going to write it here. This is the stream of the line of the sonnet, right? This is the basic starting point that we've been using all through these examples, and then I need to stream each line to uh, to the letters basically of this mm -hmm. line. Uh, so if I do it using a map and take the line and do, for instance, line uh, dot. Uh, uh, actually, we said expand. We so oh. use that expand method. Do I have it? Is that available here? Method? I don't pasted it there. Do I have it here? I got here. So I'm going to copy paste it from test one. For those of you who have the the code here. Test one line thirty one. Well, there is a private method called expand, and I'm going to copy paste this method. Never do that in your production code. Attending conferences is about seeing people doing things that you should not be doing. Yeah, we try to avoid that. But, uh. <laughs> right. So uh, this expands. What does it give me, really? Yeah, it does. It does basically. It returns a list, right, of the string. This is this is my line, and it does exactly what I need. So here, if I do it like that, I can put this in a variable. It is. It's going to give me a list. A, sorry, a stream of list and string. And I can't. I, I can't do much with that. But I'm very close to the result. In the, in the in the in the slide, there is this hint. Use flat map. And in fact, if I add a stream of stream of string. Then I could flat map that stream of stream to create this flattened uh, stream of strings. So here I should be using flat map instead of map. And this expand is not expand anymore. It's really expand s dot stream here. And this is going to give me what I expect. That is the stream of strings, and in fact, it is a stream of letters. This is the line. I'm going to rename it as a line here, and this is the stream of letter. Let me get rid of this. I don't need that anymore. And this is the stream of letters of this sonnet uh, by by using this trick. Now, this is a stream of letters, and every time, uh, for instance, if I have three. A in this in in my sonnet, this A will appear three times in the stream. And what I want to do is to count the number of times every letter is appearing uh, in that stream. There's a trick to do that, is to create in fact a map, and each of the elements, the keys of the map are going to be the letters of the sonnet that appear in the sonnet. And if I just do it using the grouping by collector. Because it's the perfect job for the grouping by collector. Yes, if I and get rid of this here. Collectors dot grouping by. So if I just say, okay, I'm going to keep the letter as the key of my map, it means that the key of the map are going to be the letters of the of the of the sonnet, and the values are also going to be the letters themselves because the values are just the elements of the stream. And if I have three A's, uh, for instance, in my sonnet, it means that in that list, I will have the three A's associated to the key that is also an A. 
Of course, this key, I want to keep it, but the list in itself, I'm not interested in it. All I am interested in is the size of this list, that is the counting of the elements of this, stream, of this list. So the, I need to pass the downstream collector here, which is the downstream collectors dot counting. And this is going to create a map. The elements of the map are strings, which are in fact letters. Okay. And the values of the map, since I use this collectors.counting here, it's not a list of string anymore, but it's a long, because the collectors.counting creates, well, counts the elements of each list. Uh, and the count, this count is in fact a long. So this is the map. And this should be this should be what I need, right? What about I try to um, print out the result of the map? Key. Well, this is a letter, and this is the count, and I can print out letter plus. Now I, this there I can use the fat arrow. <laughs> Okay, so it's not really a test, right? It's more a, a main method, this guy's in a test. And it seems to me that it's working, yeah. kind of, right? For instance, the W, I got one W. Do we have this? <laughs> yeah, I have the, the result on the next slide. So. Yeah, oh. I see that. Yeah, I got one W. I think, I think it's, it's okay. I think it's the right result. I need to put that in a test to, to check if this, if this map is the correct one. So the trick, in fact, here is that when you want to count element in a stream, it's just a, a job for the grouping by collector. You just group by using the identity function and the collectors that counting downstream collector, and this will do the trick. It will, this will just count the elements of your stream and give you the map with the histogram that we can further process. And this is what we're going to see now. Yep. Okay. All right, so let's oh, yeah, uh, go back to the slides. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, you can see the solution here, and I think that uh, I used different variable names, but essentially that's the same yeah. uh, same solution that Jose came up with. And you can see the results here at the bottom. It's a map of strings to occurrences of string. Okay. Uh, all right, so now uh, we're going to talk about uh, streaming a map or doing... Um, <coughs> The, uh, I guess the thing is, most of the time we've been talking about streaming individual elements, and all of our, um, all of our stream sources have been lists. And so basically lists are linear, and so when you stream a list, you get a, you get a stream of individual elements. And so dealing with maps is, um, is a little bit different because a map is, essentially key value pairs or map entries. And so there's no direct way to stream maps. So there's a bunch of techniques you can use for dealing with maps and streams. Um, so, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna, frame, uh, we're gonna frame this as, a, uh, as an exercise, which I guess I, I hope you're prepared to do. Uh, so I think, uh, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is in the, um, is this in the project? Did you, oh, yes, yeah. it is. It is. Oh, okay. But I think we're just gonna we're gonna plow ahead of it instead of pausing for, um, hmm? instead of pausing for to let people do it. But anyway, so we're gonna set this up as an exercise and then have Jose work for it. So uh, so let's set a um, <laughs> let's let's set an example here. Set up an example, which is let's find the uh, the most frequently occurring word in the sonnet. Okay, so you can imagine, all right, so we're gonna take the lines and split them up into words and then calculate a frequency table of the words and then find the maximum one. Um, but uh, there's, an, there's an interesting wrinkle. We actually had to change the, the input, so we rewrote Shakespeare a little bit here. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, yeah, so it was not that great, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it turns out that, okay, so if you find the, the most frequently occurring word, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting uh, problem right there. But then there's this other question, which is, what if there are several words that occur uh, the most, right? So suppose, what do we have? I think there's a word that occurs six times. Suppose there's several words that occur six times, and that's the maximum. If you get the maximum, 
It, the, if you do them, if you get the, the most frequently occurring word the simplistic way, you'll get only one of them. Um, and in fact, you might not even know which one you get. Um, so then there's a variation on the problem, which is let's try to find the list of words that occur most frequently. Okay, so um, to do that, we are going to end up having to stream a map, but you can't stream a map directly. So if you have a map and you, there's no stream method on it, so what do you do? So a map consists of entries where each entry is a key and a value. And so there's a way to get the set of entries from a map. This is old collection stuff. You can get the entry set of a map by calling the entry set method, and then you can stream that. And then what you get out of that is a stream of map entries. And so, um, it's, uh, so instead of a stream of individual elements, you get essentially a stream of pairs of elements. Okay, so then there's, there's more stuff we need to understand too, which is suppose we, uh, suppose we have a, a stream of elements and we want to find the maximum of them, right? So it turns out that there's a terminal operation on stream called max that will find the element that is greatest. Well, how does it, how does it know the ordering of the elements? Well, it could be that the, the elements are comparable. So if you have a stream of strings, you can say, you know, you can take the stream of strings and say, call max on it, and you get the string that is lexical, lexicographically or alphabetically the greatest string value. And that works because strings are comparable. They have a natural order. But map entries don't have a natural order. So what we need to do is say, okay, if we're streaming map entries, then, or, or actually it's map entries or anything that does not have a natural order or any type that is not comparable. We need to tell the max operation how these elements are to be ordered. And the way we do that is by providing a comparator. So we say we have a stream of something and we can call max and then we give it a comparator. And there's another interesting wrinkle, which is the max operation returns an optional. The reason it returns optional is that if the stream is empty, by definition, there is no maximum element. And so in that case, it returns an empty optional. Uh, if there are elements in the stream, then it will return one of the maximum ones, and that will be contained inside an optional. Okay, now we said, okay, so if our source is a map, well, actually, we take the entry set of the map and then stream that, we get a stream of map entries. And so we could write a comparator that compares, so a map entry, you can get a key and get a value, and you could say, Oh, okay, well, I want to sort these by, what are we going to do, value? Yes, we're going to, we're going to, sort, we're going to sort the map, or we're going, to, we're going to impose an ordering on map entries, which is we want to find the one that has the greatest value. So we can say for each map entry, we have, if we want to compare two map entries, imagine writing a comparator. So we went through some of this yesterday, but kind of imagine the code. Get the value from this one, get the value from this one, and then compare them. Well... You can imagine writing the code to do that as an anonymous inner class or as a Lambda expression, but it turns out that the map entry interface has a nice utility method on it that will provide a comparator that compares values. And so that's what this is in the bottom snippet, which is we can just say, if we want a comparator that compares values, we just call map.entry.comparingByValue. And so that will provide us a comparator that compares map entries by value, as its name says. And we, if we have a stream of map entries, then this is useful for finding the maximum element there. And then of course, that, that again, that returns an optional, so we have to uh, either extract that value or throw an exception. Uh, okay, in, inverting a map. Now this is, this is a little weird because we haven't seen the, oh, oh, you know what? I think we need to go through. Yeah, we need the to first go part of the example. Before you explain yeah, this, okay. yeah. Okay, let's do that. All right. Are my glasses. <clears throat> Maybe if I wait just a few seconds before this guy comes up. Oh no! Apparently it doesn't. Oh, uh, I think yeah. I think you have to wave it around until it decides yeah. to refresh something. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I've got. Uh, oh, yes. If you download the the repository from uh, 
you see I've got a bunch of imports here that are not used in this path, right? But if you download the the repository from GitHub and check the previous commits, yeah, you might find Easter eggs in it. <laughs> All right, so uh, we created a pattern here, which is with this weird stuff there, which is in fact the regular expression that will allow the, the sonnet to be divided into words, right? And on, the, on this pattern object, I've got a nifty method called split as a stream that takes a line as a parameter, basically a string of characters, and that is going to stream the, uh, this string of character by the elements uh, produced by, the comp by, by yeah. this pattern, basically. This pattern will, will split this line uh, and produce the result as a stream. And this is a very efficient way of doing things because this stream is lazily evaluated. That is, if I have a shortcut method on my stream, that is, I need to find the first word that has three letters, for instance, that we, it will not split all the, the string of characters. It will just split uh, until I find what I'm looking for. So a couple of things here. So yeah. one is we're using a more complicated regular expression here yeah. because the sonnet has a bunch of punctuation in it that, that make the, that, so we need to condition the input a little bit here. Yeah. And then the second thing is the split as stream is a variation. Remember in our previous examples we used, we just used the string dot split operation, which returns an array. And so um, you, could, you could do the split operation the same way and then use arrays.stream to convert it into a stream. And this is yeah. just a variation of that. Yeah. So if I, I'm going to use this split as stream method, if I take the sonnet once again, our good friend the sonnet, and call our good, other good friend the stream method on this sonnet, and that flat map, not to win, just flat map, regular flat map, using and say, okay, I want to split this line using this pattern dot split as stream of line, then I'm going to, get rid of this code, what I'm going to get here is just the stream of the words of the sonnet, right? Because each line is going to be split into words and flat mapped, so all the lines are going to be merged together into one big streams uh, of words. And by the way, this is a method reference, and it turns out that the code is this one, which is nice. I like to have this kind of readable mm -hmm. stuff. So now I got a stream of words, what do I want to do with the words? Oh yes, the word that appears the most frequently. Right. right. So this is once again a job for the collectors dot grouping by. It's the exact same pattern as the one we saw in the previous example. So I'm just going to keep the word as the key and pass the collectors dot counting as a downstream collector. And this is going to give me a map of strings, uh, and those strings are the words of the sonnet, and long, uh, which is the number of times this word is, uh, uh, appears in the sonnet. So it's uh, uh, words, let me call it words, yes, that's right. And maybe I should normalize things, uh, putting everything in a lowercase, for instance. What do you think? Map. Yes, I think so. Map string to lowercase. Could I, be nice. I, I would put that. Uh, oh, actually, that's true. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I was gonna, yes, I was gonna say these, was, these two here would be merged yeah. with this one. No, I was going to say put the map after the flat map, but it doesn't, oh, doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Uh, so this is my map of words. Now, what I want to do is to extract. By the way, I could put all this in a single collector, right? Because I've got a grouping by here, a flat map operation that could be a grouping, a collectors that flat mapping, and the mapping also. The flat mapping would be the downstream of the mapping, and the grouping by the downstream of the flat mapping. That would make one, two, three, four collectors mm. nested each of them. Yeah. It could be completely unreadable. Yeah. Do you want to see it? No. <laughs> I think that'd be horrifying. I'm not sure you can because you think you need to. You, you need to. Uh, I'm pretty sure I, you can. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Because you need the word. You, you need to to get the word presented to both the the. the, the. All right. Well, maybe. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you could do. It. Yeah, it would be. You're horrifying. challenging me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
Oh, that we're out of time. Sorry. No, <laughs> we still have half an hour. <laughs> All right. Woods. Okay. Why don't, why don't you actually, why don't you print that out? Well, so just, we can, we can see. Okay. Um, Let me print that out. I can, I can just get this code here yeah. because it's the same. I'm sorry. This is the words, and this is going to launch the previous test, which is the one I don't want to do. <coughs> All right, so it's not particularly sorted. I can see that thy appears six times. Um, world appears three times. The appears six times also, and two also appears six yeah. times. We, we had to add a couple of occurrences and yeah, a yeah. few words to... <laughs> so if you check the sonnet, we, we cheated, we just added this line at the end of it to make sure that yeah. we had six, yeah. two, and six, thy, and six, yeah. the. I, right? I, I, think, I think Jose and I are both going to stay in our day jobs. <laughs> What about I put this in a kind in a in a, in a variable, right? Mm, yes. Okay. So yeah, what I want to do is extract in a first step one of the words that appears the right. most frequently in the, in the, in the stream. So I don't have a stream method right on this map interface, as you mentioned it. So I'm going to take the entry set and create a stream out of it. And this is a stream, I'm going to write it here. This is a stream of the objects returned by the entry set method here, which is a map.entry of the type of the map. And I put the type of the map here, which was a good idea. So this is a map of entry of string along, right? Because this is the type of the map. So this is the stream I'm, I'm, I'm working on. And then what I just want to do is take the max. I've got a max method on the stream interface, which is very nice. And this max method expects a comparator as a, as a parameter. And I've got a, a set of comparators on the map entry interface. In fact, I've got four, comparing by key and comparing by value, if I want to compare my entries by keys or by values. And if my keys are not comparable, which might be bizarre, because the keys should be comparable. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, no, not or if I want to override the comparable nature of the key yeah. or the values, I can also pass a comparator of key or values to this comparing by key, comparing by value. Here I'm just going to use the natural order and I want to compare by value, which is the number of time each word is appearing. So this is what I just want, want to call. And here call the get method because this is going to return an optional, right? Um, uh, or yeah. else throw, actually. It's or like else throw. And this has been introduced recently, is it? Yeah, I forget. In yeah, nine, 11. Nine or 10. Oh, 10. 11, okay. Right. Oh, it says that. Oh, yeah, 10. This other, oh. You shouldn't be using optional.get, basically. Right. Which is the natural method that you want to call an optional, but don't do it. And this is going to return. So what is this going to return? This is interesting. This is going to return an element of the stream, right? And an element of the stream is this guy here. And this is the most frequent word. And I'm going to print it out. And the most frequent word is thy, which appears six times uh, in the stream. If I run it again, I should have the same result, I think, if I do it like that. Yeah. But in fact, it turns out that if I check, and we did that together, I've got three words that are appearing six times, which is to, the, and thy. And if I modify this code, that is, if I modify the implementation of the map here, okay, I'm going to inline this guy again, Refactor, okay. I can tell the, 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 the system to, uh, instead of creating a regular hash map, which is the case here, use these downstream collectors called collecting and then. And collecting and then allows me to give 
a function as a second parameter. It takes a collector as a parameter, and the second parameter is a function that is, in fact, a post-processing of the map that is going to be applied on the map that is produced. So this map is collections.copyof, is it? Uh, map.copyof. Direct no map? No, oh, so capital, it's a static method, map dot, capital map dot copy of. Oh, yeah. So copy of map. Right. Okay, which is, uh, which is itself a method reference. And this should not change the type of the map that is returned. It's just making a copy of this map. And this copy of this map is really nifty because <laughs> it makes... It makes you forget that, that you should always get the same result when you run this code, right? It will randomize. Well, we, you, maybe you, can, you should be giving the explanation yeah. because you did it. <laughs> right, okay. So, <laughs> so the, uh, if you've seen any of my other talks about collections, so, so map.copy of returns an instance of the same kind of unmodifiable map as map.of. And one of the characteristics of those maps and, and the, the corresponding set, as in set.of, is that the iteration order is randomized. And so, so earlier we had some questions about order here. And so if you stream map entries, um, certainly if the, if the map is something that has a, a definite order, like a sorted map, then of course the entries will come out in sorted order. A hash map, there's no order defined, but the order is stable. So if you put a bunch of values into a hash map, they'll kind of be randomized, so, sort of pseudo-randomized by the hash map, or by the hash code. Uh, but if you iterate the map, and then iterate it again, and iterate it again with the same values, they will almost always come out in the same order. Um, but I said almost always, because sometimes the order will change. And when that happens, it breaks people's code. And so for the new map implementations, the order actually is randomized. And so you can see that effect here. We load it into a map that, uh, that randomizes the iteration order. And we collected, we, we collected this through the, uh, the max collector. And it chose one of them. And since the input was unordered, we, there was no, there was no defined, uh, there's no definition for which one it returns if there are multiple yeah. that are also the maximum. And so you can see Jose is running it several times. And so sometimes it gets the, and sometimes it gets two, and run it again until we get the. Oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it doesn't well. rotate around. Uh, sometimes you've got the same one yeah. uh, multiple times. So this, okay. is, this is very nice, because it just tells you that you cannot expect the, 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 the max to be the first max encountered or whatever. It's just one of the max. Yeah. From, from, uh, from the stuff. All right, so how can we fix that? How can we get, instead of get one of the maxes, get all the maxes in the list? And this is what right. is going uh, to be explained here. Yeah, okay, so, so, so that's the issue here. So we have a frequency map, and the, the keys are words, and the values are the counts, and so, just from looking at the results, we happen to know that there are multiple words that have the same count, which is six, which is the maximum value. So how can we, the, so there are a bunch of different ways to do this, but there's an, uh, a, an elegant way, which, uh, which we'll demonstrate uh, in a moment, which is to say, okay, how can, we, how can we get all of the elements that have the right, um, or that have the maximum count? Well, one way to do that is to invert the map. So we have a map from word to count. So let's flip it around so that the values and the keys reverse the roles. So we can get a map from count to word. Well, not exactly, because there are multiple words that might have the same count. And so instead, when we invert the map, we, we have count as the key. And then instead of a single word that matches that count, we'll have a list of words that have that, that count. And um, if you look at this in exactly the right way, you might think, what, what kind of thing can you stream that will, that will get a key from somewhere and produce a list of values? Grouping by. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. But it's still a map. When you see a map with a key and a list of values associated yeah. to that key, you should have a little bell ringing in right, your mind. Right, exactly. So it should be a, word, a job for the grouping by, correct? Yeah, exactly. So. Okay. 
what about we do it? <clears throat> so I'm just going to to stream that map. <laughs> Thank you. We're just going to to uh, this is those are the words, right? I'm just going to try to flip that map here. So entry set dot stream. So now I have the exact same stream as the one here, right? And what I want to do is to regroup these streams of entries by the values of the entries. So it's, in fact, fairly easy. It's just a direct use of the collectors that grouping by. Now I need to, to understand that my stream is a stream of entry. Once again, it's the stream of this object. So I'm going to call it entry here. And I want to regroup all the stuff by the long that is here. That is the values of the entries. So here I've got this very useful method called get value and that gets the value of the entry which is mm -hmm. really nice and if I just keep it like that what is the stream I'm going to have it's in fact a stream sorry it's not a stream it's a map the keys of the map are this time the longs and that used to be the value of the previous map all right and the value of the map are lists but the question is of what object and the, the 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 way the grouping by works is that it gathers it gathers the elements of the stream in the values of the map, and the elements of the stream are this guy, the map entry of string and long. Okay, so this is also my words, and this is not really the map I want to use because this, here what I really want to have is only a list of string, which is the list of the words that appear this amount of time in my text. Okay, so I need to post-process the values there just to clean up the map, to have a map that is useful for me, that is not this one. So I'm going to comment this out. And in fact, what I want to do is just to transform the values put in the list in just the string that is here. This transformation takes an object and returns another object, so it's basically a mapping. So in fact, it's a job for a downstream collector that I'm going to add to this grouping by here that is going to map the elements of that stream to something else that is more handy for me. So here, I'm going to add this collectors.mapping downstream collector. This collectors.mapping is going to take the elements of those lists that are those entries. So there are more entries here. Entries. And what I'm interested in in this entry is just the key of the entry, which is the word that appears in the first stream in the first place. So here what I'm going to do is just entry dot get key. <coughs> All right. And the collectors dot mapping, as we just saw it a few minutes ago, is a collector that itself has to take a downstream collector. All those values that have been mapping, I should gather them in a structure. And this structure itself is going to be a list. So I'm going to use the collectors, the to list collector to do that. So you see that this problem is, is simple in its expression, but you need to be careful on how you want to write it. But on the other hand, all this collector here is only depending on K and V. Whatever the problem you have to solve, this pattern is always the same, right? If you, want, if you have to invert a map of k and v to a map of v and list of k, this is the exact code that you are going to write. Because it does not depend on the fact that we are manipulating a stream of strings or a stream of or a map of stream of long. It's just a regular, regular collector. And this time, the map has, I've just created is a map of long and a list, not lost, list of string. And those are my other words. And this is working. And by the way, those are method references. So I'm going to put method references here to make it, because I like it. It's just, yeah. just like that. <laughs> so you want to print out. Uh... So now I can extract, the, um, I'm not quite done, because I need to stream oh, that right. map yeah. to extract the max. But once again, all this here is also completely, uh, completely independent of the fact that I manipulated a map of long on list of string or whatever. If I, any map of k and v, I just can copy paste this code and it will work as is. 
and this time I'm not comparing by values because why doesn't it compile? Because the, the compiler has detected that the values are in fact lists and are not comparable. This is hopefully this is what I have here. Actually, that yeah, comment that, that comment up there is not. Uh, yeah, the comment is not correct. Yeah. Let me get rid of it. Yeah. Well, it's a, I, I could keep it, but fix it. It's a long yeah, and list a string. A string. Yeah. And you see that the, the compiler error is telling me that V exists so that list of string conform to comparable of something. So the compiler has detected that I've got a stream of entries and the values of the stream are lists here. Lists are not comparable, so I cannot use the comparing by value here. What I should be doing is use the comparing by key since I have inverts on my map. And this is just a map entry. <coughs> of long and list of strings and this time those are the most seen words that, can, that I can just print out to see the result and if I just run this code I should have only one max which is once again randomized okay if I run it again it's nice and this time it's die but this time I've got six and all the maxes associated to this value. So I've solved my problem by inverting the map and get all the maxes that appear in the sonnet, which is a modified sonnet once again since we had just had this uh, in it. And you could put that in a in a in a single collector, in fact, uh, which could be very, very complex because we also have a collector that max that takes a comparator. Mm. So all this can be can be put in a collector. All right. I think that's it. Okay. Get that uh, back to the slides here. And um, yes. Okay. So we finished that one. And so what I wanted to do is spend the last few minutes talking about um, talking about a different stream technique. Um, so we covered a bunch of different streaming techniques for uh, collecting. We covered streaming over maps and map entries. And so one of the things that uh, that about streams is, here, I'll put up the next slide here. Uh, if you stream, suppose you're streaming a list, or suppose you're streaming uh, some sequential elements from somewhere. Um, the stream operations operate on one element at a time. And sometimes you have problems where you want to look at adjacent elements. So you want to say, hmm, well, I want groups of adjacent elements. Or I want to say, okay, well, the sequence of elements is important, and I want to understand when something something changes between one element to the next. And the stream API does not really afford that. If, in the typical way, you're streaming the elements themselves, and when you have an element, you don't have access to the previous element or the next element. And so, essentially, there's, so there's a technique, if you have all the elements in memory, either in an array or a list or something like that, there's a technique for dealing with this sort of problem, which is instead of streaming over the elements themselves, you can stream over the indexes. And then since you have them in an array or a list, you can use the index to extract the, the current element you're working on, but also you can do minus one, plus one kind of things to get adjacent elements. All right, so let me run through some examples quickly where I do that. So let's say, let's go back to our alphabet list and say, let's divide this up into sublists of size n. And so in the example here, we have n equals 3. So instead of, uh, so here what we want to do is we want to take chunks of three elements. And this is, if you really, if you think about trying to do this by, by taking the alphabet list and saying stream on it, you get one element at a time. And, and how can you group those into lists of three? Well, you could start to write some mappers that have side effects and stuff and it gets really messy. And so essentially that, that, that kind of approach doesn't work. Or you could write a collector that does it and the collector gets kind of messy as well. But if you have all the elements in a random access list already, then instead stream over the indexes. And so what you have to do is you have to do a little bit of playing with the, uh, the index computations here. But basically you say the, the key point is to start off with an int stream dot range and then you do something usually usually starting with zero or maybe one sometimes, but in this case, we'll start off with zero, and then the range goes to something related to the size 
of the input list. And so here, what we said is we wanted to div uh, divide the list up into uh, sublists of size n. So we go, f we have a range from zero to size over n, and then, so now we have an int stream, and what we want to do is produce sublists. So we say map this to an object, which is taking the index, and then compute a sublist based on this index and the boundary uh, that, that is n farther along. And so that's what the map to obj does. And then we collect those sublists into a list. And so you can see the result there. We have alpha, bravo, charlie. So for n equals 3, we have alpha, bravo, and charlie as the first sublist, delta, echo, foxtrot as the second sublist. So we've sliced up our list into sublists of length 3. Okay. There's a problem here, which is we've truncated the last one. If your, if your list isn't exactly a multiple of n, then, then using this technique will, will um, it'll give you the maximum number of sublists of size n, but the tail is shorter than size n. So in order to deal with that, you just have to do a little bit of computation and fiddling with the stuff. But basically, you have to adjust the end of the range, and then since what that does is that you end up with a sublist that laps off the end of the list, then you have to say, hmm, well, I don't, I won't, don't want to index beyond the end of the list, so I have to constrain that, the, the ending value of the last sublist to be the, the largest index into the list. So it gets kind of messy, and you have to play around with the numbers, but if you think about it, it's a way to, uh, way to get the, um, the tail sublist in, included in your output list. Um, there are a bunch of variations on this, and I think uh, it's one of the things I, I don't. I don't. Want, we're kind of running low on time. I'm not going to spend too much time on all the details here, but there's another alternative, which is to use ranged closed, which gives you, which includes the last element, uh, the last index in the elements, and sometimes using range closed gives you uh, makes it a little easier, makes the computations on the index values a little bit easier. And so the, this one, this computation using range closed is exactly equivalent to the previous one, and the equations for, for computing the indexes are a little bit nicer. Um, okay, so I phrased this as an exercise, but I'm just going to go through this. Um, so uh, instead of asking people to look at it, um, in fact, I don't think this is in the I don't think this is in the GitHub project. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, so here, instead of having, in, instead of okay, so here's an alternative task, which is instead of grouping the lists into chunks of of three adjacent elements, we want to have them be overlapping. So you have like a sliding window into the into the input list. So how do you do that? So again, you can use this this technique of streaming over the range, and it's a little simpler because you don't have to do this, um, you don't have to do this, uh, um, uh, the, the computations are a little bit easier. So you just want to start from essentially uh, zero to the length of the list minus your window size, plus one, of course, because you need to do that, and then get a sublist from the current point to the current point plus n. And so that gives you the right uh, sublist value. And so here, it, the, 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 uh, the computations for the uh, end index are not too bad, but you have to get your plus ones and so forth in the, in the right order. If we switch to a variation where we use range closed instead, then it does become a little bit nicer. Um, I did a little thing here where basically we're indexing over the ends of the sublist. And so the sublist is the current point um, minus n. Uh, that just makes that, that just makes the arithmetic a little bit easier uh, and cleaner here. Um, but but again, I think instead of dwelling on all the details, uh, these slides will be posted later, and so I think you can look at these in leisure. Um, but I think the main point is, if you have a problem where you want to work on adjacent elements, the the thing to do, you know, one thing to try is to stream over the indexes into a list or an array instead of streaming the elements themselves. Um, all right, so I'm gonna now now. I'm going to run through an example very quickly, and I 
don't really have enough time to explain it in, in great detail. But there's another class of problem, which is the, the previous two examples where I used streaming over indexes, I wanted to split things up into fixed size sublists, either non-overlapping ones or overlapping ones. But sometimes there's a set of problems, there's a, there's a class of problems that you might have where you might want to split up your input into, um, uh, into partitions or segments or sublists not based on some fixed size, but instead based on something that is going on in the data itself. And so what you need to do is decide at each point, I'm going to have a, a split in the sublist based on this element and an adjacent element. So for instance, uh, here's an example where let's take the alphabet list and divide it up into sublists where each sublist has the property that the as as you go through the words in the sublist, the word length is non-decreasing. So what we want to do is we want to have the lengths either the same or increasing. And then as you go through the list, if a, if a word gets shorter, you want to start a new sublist. So you kind of ha you end up having, having kind of a sawtooth. And so your result will look like the, the output on the bottom, where we say alpha, bravo, charlie. OK, so those are getting longer. And the next one is delta. OK, so delta is shorter than charlie. So that goes in, it's, that starts a new sublist. Oh, echo is shorter than delta, so that starts another sublist. And so foxtrot is larger or longer than echo, so it gets, uh, it gets put into the same sublist. So how do you do that? All right, so there's, there's a multi-step trick here, but it basically involves uh, doing computations over the index. And the, the key to this technique is to say, let's stream over the index, and so at each current element have a predicate that says, hmm, is, uh, is this element the beginning of a new sublist? And in this case, we filter the indexes by saying, I'm going to look at the current element and look at the previous one and say, okay, ah, this new one is shorter, therefore this is a point at which a new sublist needs to start. So we take all those and collect them into a list. And so this is the result we see at the bottom. And it's, it's hard to visualize, but these are the indexes at which a new sublist should begin. OK, so now we have a list of integers where sublist breaks should occur. Now, how do we get the actual sublist from that? Well, we have a list of breaks. And so a sublist runs from one break to the next break. So we run the same technique again, which is to stream over the indexes and compute sublists based on the current break location and the next break location. And so what falls out is the set of sublists of non-decreasing non word length. So now th this isn't quite complete yet, but you can start to see the form of a solution here. So we have delta in its own sublist. We have echo foxtrot. They're getting larger. And then new sublist, golf, hotel, India, Juliet, those are all getting larger, or, or at least not, not getting smaller. So this is the core of the solution. The problem is we're missing the head and the tail. So how do we do that? Well, we kind of have to do a little bit of hacking here, which is to take the indexes and add a zero at one end and add size at the other end so we get a complete closed list. And then when you run the same computation again, you get the, the head and the tail sublists. So uh, this is really fast. Sorry, we're running low on time. and I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But this is the, the, uh, the full solution here. And I'll leave it up so you can, you can look at it. Uh, basically, we're, we're using this technique of streaming over indexes to get at adjacent elements in your input. And you can use this technique in, a, in, in several different cases. I think the main thing is, if you're ever running into a problem where you're streaming over the elements of some input, and you want to say, oh, I want to look at the previous element, it's really hard to do that using streams in the conventional way. So maybe it's time to try this technique of streaming over the indexes instead of streaming over the elements. All right, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I think what I will do is just put up a final slide. It has the URLs on it. If you haven't downloaded the, uh, the GitHub repos, 
Um, you can go ahead and, and get those. You can talk to us on Twitter, and we're also continuing to monitor our hashtag, LambdaHOL. Uh, so thanks for your time and attention, and we have just a couple minutes left for questions. Nope. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, question here. Oh, there was a boxed. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had a, uh, an op. Okay, so let's see if I can. Yeah, yeah. So why, why is there boxed in there? <laughs> All right, so uh, int stream returns a stream of int as a primitive, and we wanted to put them into a list. And so we had to box them into a capital I integer because you can only put uh, objects of reference type into a list. So that's what, so that's what, that, uh, that's what, that's what that is. Any other questions? Okay, I don't, okay. I don't think there's anything else. Well, thanks. Thank enjoy, you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And enjoy the rest of the conference.